Cool. So thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, if anyone wants to catch up with Daniel, uh, he's on the chat. He's also Discord, Python, and Pyjamas Discord. Uh, cool. So next now we have Rinaldi. Uh, hello. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to Pyjamas. How are you? Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm doing great. How about you? Good. Very, very good. Where are you streaming from? I'm currently streaming from Melbourne in Australia. Melbourne. That's so awesome. I'm currently in Dublin, Ireland. So... Oh, okay. Quite some time away. <laughs> yes, just a little bit. What time is it for you now? All right. Now it's uh, 9 a.m. in the morning. 9 a.m. Okay. Now, well, here it's 10 p.m. Ah, so... okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, I will let it let you take this the, the stage then. So you're going to talk to us today about cryptocurrency, right? Yep, that's right. Wonderful. So, well, thank you. Uh, let's add the slides and remove my... Cool. So, again, hello, everyone. I'm Rinaldi, and I'm going to be giving my talk, Cryptocurrency, Ledgers, and Python. Oh, my. So without further ado, we'll just dive straight into it. So I'm going to be telling a bit about myself as well first. So I'm a founder and developer advocate at Gray Studio. I'm certified in AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. My personal field of interest is within security and accessibility practices. And it falls in line as well with blockchain because I always try to strive to develop blockchain applications that can really be called secure and can really be kept, uh, the integrity of it can be kept uh, intact, essentially. And also, on the side, I have a few hobbies as well, such as uh, running some meetups, uh, running hackathons, doing tech talks. I've been um, doing tech talks, uh, sharing my best practices and about many other topics in many other fields uh, for the past four to five years now. And on the side, I also am a huge VR tech enthusiast as well, playing with new VR technology, seeing where uh, development goes, and also just experimenting with uh, the apps and developments that come out with uh, VR technology in general. So here's the agenda for our talk today. First, I'm gonna be talking about the motivation developing blockchain, as of course, we need to be able to get a motivation first, such as why do you wanna use Python for developing blockchain technology and such. And after that, I'm going to talk about benefits of using Python with uh, blockchain technology. Steps of uh, to being able to create blockchain is next. Fourth is simple mistakes that you can avoid to be when developing blockchain applications. Fifth, the potential for creating bigger apps. Essentially, in this case, I'll be talking about how you're able to apply it to bigger case scenarios. Since in this particular case study, I'll be just showing a development of a very simple ledger cryptocurrency based application that you can make yourself. And finally, we're going to be wrapping up. So firstly, what is the motivation developing blockchain? So blockchain has been getting increasingly popular at this time, especially during this time, due to the current pandemic situation that we have been going through, even before it was already popular. We have already seen it uh, being applied by the big companies to create uh, many different applications, such as smart contracts, uh, creating a uh, building based on Hyperledger and many other applications. But we have seen it grown even more now because in this current uh, era uh, where we currently are working from home, uh, due to the COVID-19 restrictions, we've seen more and more people start to adopt a more distributed systems approach to everything. We've been seeing more people adopt a ledger-based approach, and it has become more important than ever now to be able to understand how the whole development system process in blockchain, uh, blockchain and for example, Python works, and being able to understand better how we're able to develop apps based on it. So outside of that, we also, if you're already familiar with blockchain, then you know that one of its biggest and most important properties is that records cannot be altered. And that is one of the most important things as well when we talk about uh, developing blockchain applications. We need to be able to ensure that the integrity 
is maintained. And that is one of the benefits as well, that because it essentially functions as its own record management system. You can't alter it from outside, and that's one of the best advantages of it. And finally, it provides an easy way of providing transactions, and it also lets you keep control of the records easily from the central uh, system. So it eas easily makes up for, uh, it easily constitutes a very coherent and integrity-based uh, integrity system for uh, providing a distributed and decentralized system for uh, tracking cryptocurrency. And benefits of using Python with blockchain technology. So first off, it's simple and reliable. It's very easy to start off, as I'll demonstrate as well through this uh, these, uh, this particular talk. And it's very reliable, as I mentioned before, because it essentially serves as a proof of work, which I'll discuss as well in the next few slides. It helps you to be able to keep track of everything from a centralized location. It allows you to add query lists without the need for parallel transactions, which is a very important property as well that we need from uh, blockchain technology. It provides us, uh, uh, Python provides us with ready to use blockchain libraries. And this falls in line as well with the fact that it is uh, there's a very active open source community for blockchain. Throughout my development process with blockchain, throughout my experimenting process of uh, trying to develop a uh, interesting side projects and also for the use of uh, my own purposes as well within my organization. Uh, I've already been so uh, engaged with uh, being able to just see how active the community really is and really seeing the all the libraries already provided by the community, helping to also already build on applications. And this includes also open source libraries such as Hyperledger, for example, it's, it's really great to see that the community is really active and that also makes developing uh, much easier within Python because we are able to use those open source libraries and uh, the community is still very active with uh, questions that are uh, regarding blockchain. So it's really helpful when uh, starting out with blockchain and definitely when we start out of a journey, such uh, kind of a, an optimism and an engagement is necessary for us to really understand uh, well uh, what we need to be able to do uh, with blockchain. And of course, major blockchain uh, platforms uh, right now, such as Ethereum, currently already are based on Python. So it really does provide a proof of concept that it really does work with, uh, well with uh, blockchain when the big ones, such as uh, Ethereum, use it as well. So when we talk about steps to the blockchain, there are quite a few steps. So in this particular uh, example, I'll be de demonstrating on how to be able to build a particular blockchain system based on a hypothetical cryptocurrency. So we will be going to a few steps. So this, the first step will be understanding how mining works first. It's very important to be able to understand how it works first. I'll not be going too in, in depth into the concept of how mining works because I don't intend this to be uh, kind of like a tutorial on how uh, mining or blockchain works, uh, but rather have this as a highlight on how blockchain is applied to Python, because I'm aware that there are a lot of uh, sources and references online to already check out how mining and blockchain or cryptocurrency uh, works in general. And afterwards, we have to define a block alongside the concept of a transaction so essentially, we, we need to con we need to be able to convey what what do we would want to define as a block and what is a transaction in our particular case scenario. That those are the important elements that we need to define while we start our code uh, and developing our particular blockchain system. We then want to build the blockchain system. Afterwards, we then define a way to add new blocks through the mining process, and this will be also shown. Uh, in the next couple of slides as well. And finally, how do we are able to use a REST API to be able to create the mining process, to be able to simulate and test the mining process. So first off, I'm just gonna be showing some code. In this particular case scenario, we define a block first. So as you can see, we defined quite a few properties here to start off with. We define the index, the timestamp, uh, because these are these are all properties that need to be tracked within 
uh, each of the blocks. We need to be able to track what index the block is in and what, what the particular time it is in, the transactions involved with it. Uh, we need to be able to track the previous hash that is involved with it. And hashing is a central part of uh, being able to develop within uh, blockchain. And I'll be also showing that in the next slide as well. And of course, uh, identifying the nonce. And in this particular scenario, the nonce is uh, essentially it's a number added to the hashed or encrypted block. And essentially, when it is rehashed, it can meet the difficulty level restrictions. For those who are not too familiar with uh, difficulty level, I'll be explaining that as well as we go along the code. And in this particular case, nonce is the number essentially blockchain miners are solving for in order to create the proof of work. And as I mentioned before, we create a particular process to hash the blocks. So as you can see uh, in this particular scenario, we uh, have a function called compute hash. We essentially, uh, basically in this case, we return a particular hash based on SHA-256 uh, to be able to encode the particular uh, block string. Uh, and essentially, we then are able to encode it, and we're able to return that particular uh, encoding based on that particular uh, the SHA-256 uh, encryption standard. So afterwards, we then go into coding the blockchain itself. So when we go into this, we then start to see as well uh, how we're able to go along with uh, the start the coding of the whole blockchain. And in this particular scenario, we're essentially creating immu immutability by including hash of the previous block uh, within the current block. And we then create a particular system of awareness, shared awareness of data to be able to help establish the integrity of the chain. So. As you can see over here, we define quite a few uh, parameters here, uh, unconfirmed transactions. And essentially, in this particular scenario, when we talk about unconfirmed transactions, we want to be able to start keeping track of which transactions we've already confirmed and which transactions we have not yet confirmed. Because it is important, we need to be able to confirm transactions as we go along to be able to confirm that they do match the requir uh, requirements, uh, including the difficulty level standards, and also that it is valid as a block. We then also define the chain. We then define a particular uh, block. And in this case, I call it a magic coin block. And I just like to also give a disclaimer that I do not intend to uh, create any particular reference to any existing cryptocurrency because Honestly, when I was uh, trying to select a particular name for a hypothetical coin, I was I think I searched about like uh, five to 10 searches and every search I got, there was already a coin with that name. And so far, Magic Coin didn't have that name. So I apologize in advance if it does exist, but I do not intend to actually reference a coin that does exist. So uh, with that in mind, we, uh, we then uh, particularly create a method for uh, creating a magic coin uh, block method uh, in this particular case. We the, in this particular case, we define how it is captured essentially. We, 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 we assign a particular, uh, we, we assign a particular um, block, uh, we assign the block uh, the particular uh, time and we assign zeros to the front of it because that is essentially going to be the start of our proof of work algorithm, which I'll also talk about in the next few slides. And we then start hashing it. We then, uh, by computing the hash as uh, evidenced by the previous method, we then start to append the particular, uh, the block towards the chain that we've already defined. And this will uh, eventually be a continuous process. We'll continue appending new blocks towards this cool chain. And essentially, it'll move on from unconfirmed transactions to then being confirmed into the chain. So it's essentially be continuing to go in that, that direction. And of course, we then all, always want to be able to capture uh, which is the last block. And that's why we also define a particular last block uh, f and capture uh, the, the, the minus one index in that particular chain. And just an important note about hashing as well, SA 
uh, SHA-256 uh, is not the only way, uh, it's not the only hashing algorithm to, to do blockchain. There are possible other ways. It's just that SHA-256 is the most standard way. It's what Bitcoin uses, for example, and it's what other a lot of other cryptocurrencies have used. But it is not the only way. It's, it, it essentially already functions as a proof of work algorithm, which is why it is very popular uh, within the cryptocurrency community. So essentially, if you do want to try other hashing algorithms, it's definitely possible. It's just that SHA-256 is the most popular one that's currently used. And afterwards, we then start creating a proof of work algorithm. And in this algorithm, as you can see, we define a difficulty level. And at the difficulty level, essentially, uh, we essentially uh, show how much work uh, needs to be done, essentially, to be able to uh, establish a particular uh, Work, work that uh, proof of work that uh, needs to be done. And essentially, in this particular uh, case, proof of work essentially a uh, consensus algorithm, which is uh, used in the blockchain network, which we then use to confirm transactions and produce new blocks to the chain. Essentially, in this case scenario, we need to be able to scan for a uh, value that uh, starts with a given number of uh, zero bits uh, when it is hashed. And this number of zero bits is going to be the difficulty. And it'll function as a zero knowledge proof to show between parties that uh, work has been done, which shows that uh, the mining has been done essentially to be able to prove that uh, we currently do possess that particular currency. So in this case scenario, we then compute the hash. Uh, we then, uh, as you can see, we then start to be able to uh, check if it, uh, that it does not yet uh, start with zero. And um, as, as mentioned before, at uh, zeros to represent the difficulty, and we then uh, multiply it by difficulty, and we then add uh, the nonce to it to be able to then check if the work uh, has been done, and afterwards we return the computed hash as part of the proof of work. We then start adding and validating blocks. So in this particular scenario, we want to be able to store data of uh, each transaction into unconfirmed transactions and add it to the chain uh, after being able to confirm that the new block satisfies the difficulty criteria and thus being able to satisfy the need uh, for the proof. And uh, this is also where the mining itself begins within uh, blockchain. So we then start to be able to uh, add blocks towards the, uh, towards the, the system. And uh, in this particular scenario, I call the particular chain uh, system mine. And we then start to be able to uh, check the previous hash. We, we've used this last block method to be able to capture the last hash. We then start to be able to uh, then start to uh, check if the uh, use of using a validator, uh, which we defined below as well. We do, we make a particular validator for the chain to be able to return a uh, blockchain hash, uh, the block hash. We then uh, compute the particular hash we, we, to be able to uh, check that it does match the particular uh, hash according to the difficulty level as well that uh, has already been uh, determined from the beginning. We check if it does match it. And if it's not, valid, it's not, it's not uh, validated by the validator, we'd return a false. But else, we let it go through. And uh, we then essentially uh, uh, we then initialize the hash towards the uh, system by chain itself. So then we are able to then finally return true if it does, uh, if everything checks out, and then we add the block towards the chain if it all matches. And then we need to adjust the work needed to mine the blocks. In this particular case scenario, we start adding a new transaction. And as you can see, we start to also append the particular uh, firstly towards uh, unconfirmed transactions. As I mentioned before, we firstly go forward first. And towards the mine, we then also check if uh, we then check if it's already within uh, unconfirmed transactions. Uh, if it's not, we didn't return a false. We then also start to be able to initialize the last block to, uh, well, last block itself uh, from the self method. Uh, and Afterwards, we then initialize a, a new block. We then create a particular new proof of work. Uh, this is essentially going to function as kind of like the main method of everything. We then um, go into adding a new block. 
we initialize the curvature axis to zero again when we've already finished everything. And finally, we return the new block index. Afterwards, we then define the user flask to be able to test the blockchain uh, with a REST API. So in this particular instance, we can use flask to be able to test, uh, create a REST, a REST API to be able to build that interface, uh, to be able to test multiple nodes, to get them to interact with each other and eventually be able to test it out. So in this particular instance, we're calling the blockchain based on Flask. So essentially, uh, we'll be also connecting it with the next slide as well, which is essentially to be able to get the chain. So in this particular instance, we're essentially going to be able to root to be able to define our web application and create a local blockchain while being able to specify a endpoint which allows us to send a query to display uh, information we need about the blockchain. So we need to be able to do this by uh, essentially, uh, firstly, tracking the bl blockchain information that's already currently available. We go for uh, basically tracking the blocks that are in within the chain. We append the uh, chain data that is already uh, currently uh, within the blocks. And we then go into running the application uh, based on a specified uh, port number and also uh, sending the debug to true. And we can see the results in the next slide. And as we can see over here, when we run the particular uh, uh, blockchain that we've created, we'll receive something similar to this. We've, we, we'll see something, uh, a timestamp such as this. We'll be able to uh, see a particular hash that's created based on it. We'll be able to see uh, length and also the hash, previous hash, and be able to see the nonce as well. And we'll be able to keep track of I suggest this, and each time we run it, we'll be able to keep tracks of uh, the mining process and the blocks uh, through such a process such as this. And we'll be able to uh, really uh, create a continuous uh, mining um, application based on this particular case scenario. So some simple mistakes to avoid are firstly, that the blockchain scales well. That is one of the most fatal mistakes to make in blockchain because blockchain essentially is something you need to plan beforehand as well. It's not something that can be scaled around easily. So it's something that needs to be kept in mind while uh, talking about blockchain. And of course, we have the misconception of interoperability. We need to be able to ensure that, uh, uh, because blockchain essentially, although it is a very popular thing, it is not a thing that is already interoperable with many applications. It's something that we need to also be keeping into mind. Not uh, it, It's supported by a lot of platforms, but not all platforms support mind you. So it's something that needs to be kept in mind as well when we talk about uh, developing blockchain. Also, designing as a core complete business application is also a wrong thing to do because it is by no means a complete business application. It definitely helps to support business applications, but it is no way in a, as a standalone core business application on its own. So it always needs to be kept into mind as well if we are developing uh, blockchain applications. Not creating immutable, immutable data audit trails is also a big uh, mistake as well uh, in blockchain. And also assuming that technology is mature because it is a continuously developing uh, technology. And of course, we have the potential for bigger applications as well. Being able to de design a new cryptocurrency with more classes, just a wallet, centralized uh, update system, and much more. And as I mentioned in the beginning as well, being able to uh, build on and utilize open source projects such as uh, Hyperledger, uh, I know IBS, for example, uh, doing a lot of applications on Hyperledger, uh, developers are building on Hyperledger to be able to create blockchain for your own purposes as well and for research purposes. Uh, so it's really great to see uh, so many uh, companies are using it as well to be able to support their own systems and to be able to really create uh, smarter systems as well, just as smart contracts for their own applications and also uh, really build on uh, uh, proof of work systems as well, which really do a lot of good in the companies. And also to be able to design and develop for supply chains is a big potential application. And we are able to create smart contracts, as I mentioned before, uh, make payments and provide proof of work systems for uh, supply chain management. And finally, wrapping up, we need to be able to experiment and see how it works in your projects. So essentially, it's something that doesn't really come out overnight. Blockchain is something you have to play around first, get used to it, and really see how it works. Use it as a support system as your new projects. It's really a fun thing to experiment, especially with the active community. You're able to really 
uh, get a feel of how the community really embraces uh, blockchain and really also understand how it's uh, applied in a lot of projects. And do not assume that technology is already fully adaptable as a regular product because blockchain is a continually evolving a technology. By no means is it mature. It is going to be continually uh, being developed over time. And essentially, we'll continue seeing developments and new fixes to it. And we'll be seeing a lot of ups and downs as well. So it's all going to be about the following the journey as well, about how, how the project goes. And also, adapt an agile culture to be able to quickly evaluate performance every step. Because, uh, because uh, blockchain is a very volatile, um, should I say, uh, technology, we'll be able to see a lot of uh, changes to it rapidly as well. So because of this, we need to be able to quickly adapt and evaluate performances uh, quickly. And due to this, we'll need to be able to uh, quickly uh, evaluate accordingly based on each step and make decisions when we decide to use blockchain in our vertical systems. So an agile culture really helps out this, with this because we'll be able to evaluate uh, in each step because it's an agile culture. We'll be able to keep track of how it goes in each step and make uh, decisions accordingly uh, when we do see fit. So uh, that's all for me. Uh, thank you again for uh, listening to my talk. I'm really happy to be here today to share uh, my knowledge about uh, developing blockchain applications, albeit it's a, quite a simple one, but I'm definitely sure that it'll be able to help you uh, go into developing bigger applications for your business or side projects. And I'm happy to also, uh, if there are any post call for questions, I'm happy to take any on um, Twitter or my uh, LinkedIn as I put there. And again, uh, thank you as well. And thank you as well to all the conference organizers for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. That was awesome. Yes, I learned a lot about Hyperledger. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Lai. Thank you very much. And well, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. You too. Bye. Wonderful. So uh, for a short break now, um, a quick word from our sponsors uh, and then straight to the next stop.